once again. Um, this is the last video lecture that you'll have to do for Weld 1760. This is chapter 17 in your textbook. It's page 595. And we're going to talk about different types of arc cutting processes. Um, here in the welding lab, you should already know how to use a, an oxyacetylene cutting torch. If you don't, then certainly get with your instructors and take Weld 1715 and learn how to use an oxyacetylene cutting torch. Uh, the other two cutting processes that we're going to teach you in, in this class are plasma arc cutting and carbon arc cutting air, uh, more commonly referred to as an air arc. Both of those processes are covered in Chapter 17, along with some other more exotic ones that you may or may not uh, come across in your, in your experience. So let's start on page 595 under the heading that says arc cutting. And I'm going to read from your textbook. It says, arc cutting processes melt metal along a desired line of cut with the heat generated by an electric arc. A number of the processes also use oxygen, compressed air, or one of the inert gases in addition to the arc. Several of the arc processes compare favorably with oxyfuel gas cuts in quality of cut. The primary advantage of arc cutting is that it can be used on all types of metals. Some of its applications include cast iron, scrap, aluminum, magnesium, titanium, copper, carbon steel, and stainless steel. Now I put a little, a, a, a little star by that to, to remind me, you may have a question that asks, what kind of material will, will arc cutting processes cut? So you may want to put a, put a star by that or highlight that, bullet that. Over on the next page it says, arc cutting equipment is also used for hole piercing, rivet cutting, gouging, and other special uses. So again, you might want to highlight that. Arc cutting is done with plasma arc, the carbon arc, and the metal arc. Now we get to plasma arc. Understand those abbreviations, P-A-C. Know that that means plasma arc cutting. Uh, they also have a plasma arc welding, but those initials would be P-A-W. So, but we're going to do the cutting part. It says plasma arc cutting, it says figure 17.3, is similar in many aspects to the gas tungsten arc uh, process. Uh, this process was in introduced by the Lindy Division of Union Carbide in 1955. Both automated and manual equipment produce economical, high quality, ready to weld cuts. An oxyacetylene cutting torch cannot cut aluminum, magnesium, or stainless steels because those metals form oxides when exposed to the oxygen. Uh, a little caveat about stainless steel, you can cut stainless steel using oxy fuel if you use what's called a waster plate and you put it on top, it's carbon plate, you put it on top of the stainless, clamp it down and, and you can make a cut. It's kind of like sandwiching it. So it is possible but it takes special techniques. Um, the oxides re resist further oxidation, the basis of oxyacetylene cutting. The plasma arc process, figure 17-4, can cut these metals because the air arc stream is much hotter than the melting temperatures of both the metals and their oxide. It is also a high speed process. The only requirement for plasma cutting is that the metal being cut must be able to conduct electricity. By blowing out molten metal, the forceful plasma cutting jet forms the kerf. Everybody should know what a kerf is by this time. Um, if you don't know, get with me. All it is is that, that slit in the metal where that metal has been removed you, uh, through the cutting process. Put a bullet by this, it says plasma. Plasma is the fourth state of matter. Uh, the others are gas, liquid, and solid. We have those all around us. But plasma, unlike gas, is, an ion is ionized so that it can conduct e an electric current. Put a bullet by this. An ion is an atom or a group of atoms that has lost or gained electrons so that it can carry a positive or a negative charge. Thus, the purpose of the gas used in the plasma arc process is different from that used in the oxycetylene process. And the inert gas produces uh, processes of TIG, MIG, and MAG. Instead uh, of producing a flame for cutting the work or shielding the operation from the atmosphere, uh, the gas is superheated so that it can actually maintain an electric arc. So that's what plasma is. It's a superheated, superheated ionized gas. Because maximum transfer of heat to the work is essential, 
Plasma arc torches use a transferred arc for cutting in which both the material being cut and the torch act as electrodes in the electric circuit. The work is thus subjected to plasma arc heat. And they wanted to make sure they got you, got you to understand a transferred arc so that it's going from, from the, the electrode to the work and not what they call a non-transferred. That's where sometimes the, uh, in plasma arc welding, for example, they have transferred and non-transferred welding. And what happens is, uh, I think you have a picture of it. Yeah, turn to page 601. This figure at the top of your page there shows you non-transferred and transferred. In the transferred one, it's going to come out of the tip and go right on down here uh, to the work. That's transferred, okay? It's jumping that gap. It's going across there. Non-transferred, you can see it comes from the tip and it arcs out against the cup itself. Generates heat, but it doesn't actually transfer the arc. And that's what they mean, uh, mean in the welding process of it. And that's how you get a transferred and non-transferred. Now in the cutting, we use the transferred. Going back to your book sir, here, it says, in the plasma arc torch, the tip of the electrode is located uh, within the nozzle. It's kind of recessed a little bit. Uh, the nozzle has a relatively small opening which constricts the arc. The high pressure gas must flow through the electric arc where it is heated to the plasma temperature of approximately 25,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a bullet. A temperature far higher than any, that, uh, than any, of it, any kind of a flame. And it it, it, that temperature can vary depending on what you're using um, to create your plasma. If you're using compressed air, you're going to get one temperature. If you're using nitrogen gas, you're going to get a different temperature. Nitrogen gas can give you temperatures of 40,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the expanding gas uh, as a result of the heat is forced through the small opening in the nozzle where it emerges in the form of a sonic jet at high velocity. The hot, hot jet of gas can melt any known metal. The high velocity of gas blasts the molten metal through the kerf to produce a high quality cut which is free of oxide slags. Argon, nitrogen, air, oxygen, and nitrogen, hydrogen, and argon, hydrogen mixtures are used in the plasma arc process. I'd put a, put a bullet by that and try to remember, try to hang on to a few of those names. Uh, let me show you real quickly a handheld unit. This is the one that you will actually be using in our welding lab. This is a handheld plasma arc cutting system. It's got a cup and the cup holds in place this cap. Inside the cap is the tungsten the electrode where the arc comes from and you may have to change this and I'm going to show you how it's done. We don't want it to fall out so I'll tip it back. Take off this plastic cup. We have replacement cups in the welding lab and then you're going to remove this cap and if you can zoom in on that, you can see that that cap is pretty melted. And the orifice, that center hole, has been elongated from the heat of the arc coming out of there. And it's deformed it. After it's deformed it to a certain degree, it won't f function right. And, it's, and that's when you know it has to be replaced. Let me show you the, the cup now. Uh, this is the tungsten itself. And it just pulls out. And if you zoom in on that, you'll see that the tungsten is pitted. And that's because it's uh, carried, a, carried an arc so many times that it's, that it's pitted. And as it was pitting, it was also rounding out that cap. Now, these new ones, I'm going to go ahead and replace them. This is a new one. You can see it's nice and smooth. And it looks just like the other one. And incidentally, you can see pictures of these on page 616 in your textbook. They're almost identical to these ones I'm showing you. And these simply slip into the head of the plasma cook cutting torch like so. And then the cap, here's the new one. Look, look how small that orifice is before it gets uh, melted away. And that's what, what a new one would look like. And it just sets over top of this like so and recesses. And, and you can feel it's kind of got a little spring load in there. Then you put the cap back on and just hand tighten it like so. And that's all there is to it. When you're ready to, to make your cut, you simply pull the trigger. And when you pull the trigger, the air begins to flow, the compressed air. Ours runs on compressed air. 
and you'll see a little carrier wave, a high frequency carrier wave come out, a little blue, blue light. It'll be about yay long. And it'll stay on for three or four seconds before it goes out. It'll go out unless it uh, catches a piece of steel. It, it, if you bring it close to a piece of steel to start your cut, and then, then, then the cutting flame will go ahead and jump across that carrier wave, and you'll ramp up to your, to your plasma cutting temperatures. But if not, then it'll go out automatically. So when you finish a cut and come off the steel, it'll just go out. On, if you were to continue holding that, it would go out automatically, or you can release the trigger and it'll go out. And it's really a simple little system to use. So let's go back to your textbook now. Um, everything that we're going to talk about on these next two pages are mechanized, mechanized uh, plasma arc cutting, as opposed to our little handheld one. Now, look at all these bulleted items they have on here. I'm just going to hit the highlights of them. The torch, the typical torch is shown in figure 17.7, and it can be used for cutting all metals. It is water-cooled and may be equipped with a variety of nozzles to permit the use of different gases. Ours is not water-cooled. It's air-cooled, and it's not, it's not meant to use on, be used on very thick stuff. The controls. Here we have, at the bottom of the page, we have a picture of a control unit. The control unit provides the sequence of operations and controls all the functions such as the, the arc starting, varying the gas flow, varying the power level, the carriage travel, if you have it set up on a carriage, uh, and the flow of water to keep it cool. Over on the next page, environmental controls. It says a tremendous amount of noise and fumes are generated with high-powered mechanized plasma arc cutting. A common approach to overcome the noise and fumes is, is to cut over a water table. That's a bullet. Understand what a water table is. Uh, and surround the arc with a water shroud. I had the good fortune to watch the uh, Space Shuttle uh, Flight 114 blast off from Flo Cape Canaveral here uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And to suppress the noise of that engine taking off before it ever lifted off, they began dumping 325,000 gallons of, of water a second at the base of that rocket. Uh, so whenever you see one of these things take off and you see those big white pillowing pumes of, of smoke, that's not smoke, that's steam, because they're suppressing the noise of those rocket engines as, as they ignite and, and, and take off. Even with that suppression system, you could still feel it thumping against your chest, the pressure of it moving the air. Same thing happens here. Uh, plasma arc cutting is very loud, and when you go into the, into the booth and try this, uh, just this handheld torch, you'll see what I mean. But on a w water table, they're using higher amperages, faster speeds, cutting thicker metals. It's going to be even noisier, so they use water to suppress that noise. So again, reading from your book, in order to surround it with a water shroud, they ha the uh, cutting table has to be filled with water up to the work supporting surface. A water shroud attachment is done to the torch and a circulating pump to circulate filtered water from the water table through the shroud. Another method is to completely submerge the part to be cut under approximately three inches of water. Thus the working end of the torch and the cut are completely submerged. While the torch is underwater and not cutting, a flow of compressed air prevents water from entering the torch. Now I want you to put a bullet by that. That may be a question on your test. Uh, Coloring agents can be added to the water to reduce the glare of the arc. Electrodes, special tungsten electrodes held in place by a collet, are used in the cutting torch. The electrode type, shape, and location are critical for proper operation. Power supply, direct current, electrode, negative constant current type power sources are used. A power source with an open circuit voltage in the range of 150 to 400 volts is required. And again, we're talking about mechanized now, not, uh, not handheld like this. To com give you a comparator here, the open circuit voltage on your welding machine is only about 80 volts. So this is much higher voltages. Regulators, you're going to use gas regulators, gas pressure regulators, and flow meters to control the flow of the plasma gas and the shielding gas. Uh, cutting gases, aluminum, stainless steels, and other non-ferrous metals require a non-oxidizing gas for cutting, such as a mi mixture of argon hydrogen or nitrogen. Carbon steel cast iron, and certain alloy steels require an oxidizing gas, which provides additional heat from the iron ox oxygen reaction at the current point. Uh, separately supplied nitrogen, oxygen, or compressed air may be used for these metals. 
uh, water supply. Uh, if you're going to use a cutting table, you've got to have water at a high pressure and a high rate of flow, and you may have to circulate it. Uh, manual plasma arc cutting, which is what you'll do. Drop down to the middle of that paragraph, it says, typical manual cutting cap capabilities include one and a quarter inch thick stainless steel and one inch thick aluminum. The equipment needed includes a manual torch, supply of electrodes, uh, power source, and a control unit. Uh, the unit we have won't cut that thick. It'll only cut up to about three-eighths of an inch thick, but you can buy them to cut thicker materials. The torch, it's going to be an air-cooled torch with a 100 ampere ca uh, capacity. It's a popular model. It has a right-angled head. Uh, the pilot arc, which I've already described, the pilot arc is established by pressing the switch on the head torch. The cutting arc is established when the torch is brought within one half inch of the workpiece. That's when it'll jump across there. The arc is immediately extinguished when the welder releases the, the uh, torch switch. So I, I want you to put a bullet by that. I want you to know how you shut that thing off. Plasma arc studying, uh, starting with high frequency. Some of them have a high frequency. When plasma arc cutting power source is turned on and the trigger or torch switch is closed or turned on, there will be approximately two to three seconds of preflow of gas or air before the pilot arc starts. And you'll hear that when you, when you use this unit. The pilot arc is an arc between the electrode and the torch tip. This pilot is a non-transferred, non-cutting arc. When the cutting gas or air reaches the pilot arc, it is superheated to over 30,000 degrees. Uh, when this pilot arc is brought into close proximity to the workpiece, the electric circuit is complete. This is referred to as a transferred or cutting arc. A pilot arc relay will open and shut and uh, the pilot power off. And then uh, we finally reach these two pictures that I was telling you about earlier. So the pilot arc in this case, remember plasma arc welding, you have transferred and non-transferred types of arcs. But here the pilot arc is a non-transferred which is a precursor to establishing the primary arc. Um, drop to the bottom of page 601 where it says cutting gases. The manual torch is designed to use compressed air. Uh, a mixture of 80% argon and 20% hydrogen may be used based on cut quality, brightness, fume generation, and cost. The secondary or cooling gas when used, uh, we don't use any, can be argon or nitrogen since manual Plasma arc cutting is generally done with air, a compressor external to the power source, or special power sources with air compressor built in or available. We, used, uh, we, we have compressed air throughout all of the college labs, so that's not a problem. The advantages of plasma arc cutting. Both the mechanized and manual plasma cutting processes produce economical, high-speed, ready-to-weld cuts. Uh, they are intended to replace less efficient, slower methods such as sawing, powder cutting, and oxyacetylene cutting on some special applications. The advantages, again they bulleted these items for us so you can uh, know what the advantages of the system are and it would behoove you to go ahead and pay attention to some of these advantages. They can produce slag free cuts on carbon and stainless steels, on nickel, on monel, on inconel, cast iron, clad steels, aluminum, copper, and magnesium. They produce clean cuts on most metals up to five inches thick, precision cuts with a narrow kerf, minimum heat affected zone. Um, if you had to cut a thin piece of steel and you didn't want it to warp, you might want to use the plasma arc cutting system because of the heat input. Although it can be 30,000 degrees, you're done so fast that it doesn't create much warpage as opposed to an oxyacetylene torch. So it has a minimum heat affected zone. Uh, cutting speeds of up to three inches 300 inches per minute can be achieved. Uh, cuts on, uh, of such quality that machining or machining or finishing uh, is not needed in many cases. And there is almost no distortion of metals when using the plasma arc cutting process. There is no bow bowing or camphoring except for a microscopically thin layer at the cut surface. Um, there is one thing that they don't tell you in here and almost every cut that you make with, with a plasma arc is going to Instead of, instead of giving you a crisp, clean, right angle cut, uh, you're going to find when you're cutting with this that it's going to leave a little shelf off to the right. And it's always off to the right. And it, I might be exaggerating a little bit, but it looks something like that. Um, and you, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about as soon as you use it. It, it, it won't give you a nice, nice square cut like this. And that's not just our machine. That's the characteristic of, 
of a lot of plasma arc. It'll leave a little shoulder or a little shelf to the right hand side of your cut. Um, drop down to the next bullet, it says cutting carbon steel. Uh, I want you to, while you're going through this class, you're going to cut carbon, aluminum, and stainless. That's what, what you're uh, required to do on your course outline, so let's read about it. The plasma arc process uh, produces slag-free cuts in carbon steel with smooth surface and sharp edges. No preheating is required. Stack cutting of sheets produces cuts com comparable to those obtained when cutting one sheet of equal thickness. So you can stack a bunch of little 16-gauge uh, plate together, cut it with this thing, and it should cut them all. Whereas with oxyacetylene, you may get blowback. It may cut through one and then blow back up in your face or run out, try to run out between the layers. But with plasma arc, you should be able to cut right through them. Um, while it is possible to obtain fairly good results if inert gases are used to cut carbon steel, superior results are obtained when nitrogen and oxygen are used. And that's because, as I said before, it all depends on the heat transfer that you're trying to get across the arc. Uh, nitrogen, argon, uh, they'll all produce higher temperatures than, than just plain old compressed air. You'll get more heat transfer across the arc. Uh, cutting stainless steel, completely slag-free plasma arc cuts in stainless steel up to two inches thick, thick have eliminated the need for further finishing. Radiographic quality welds can be produced without further cleaning of cut surfaces. Cut quality of high strength alloys, including those with a high nickel or cobalt content, is similar to those of stainless steel. Uh, stainless steel and non-ferrous metals are generally cut with mixtures of argon and hydrogen or with nitrogen mixtures. Uh, I've, I've had to do this in the field, cutting 347 stainless steel tubing out of a power plant, and we used nitrogen, and it was a huge unit. This, the, the, the power supply and everything was bigger than this podium I'm standing at, and uh, a pretty elaborate system, but it cut it really nice, just like, like a hot knife going through butter. It, it, it did a fine job. Cutting aluminum, plasma arc cutting methods provide equal or better quality at much faster speeds than other cutting flames. So, those are the three you're going to do. It's in your course outline. Those are the basics. Of course, before you get started, Jeff Brager or I will give you a demonstration. Wear your earplugs, wear your safety glasses, and be safe while you're in there. And basically, we're, uh, we're not really going to grade you on your cuts, but you have to do it so that you've been exposed to these different types of cutting methods. Okay, that's all on plasma arc. Next one I want to talk about is air carbon arc. This is probably, next to oxyacetylene, this is probably the most common type of cutting process that you're going to run across. Several years ago, 1993, uh, we did a survey and we asked a lot of local industry what would they like their people to know if they were coming out of here and hiring people from the college, and they said they'd like them to know how to use an air arc. Well, we were already teaching air arc, but it wasn't really emphasized, but it is emphasized now. We want you to know how to use an air arc because it's such a common tool. You need to know how to use it. Uh, it's noisy, it's loud, it's fumey, throws a lot of spatter. It's not really a, a, a nice thing to use, but you still need to know how to use it because you may be called upon to do so. So, the air carbon arc cutting, CAC-A, more commonly referred to as air arc, is a method of cutting and gouging by melting the work with an electric arc and blowing away the molten metal with a strong jet of compressed air. Uh, an arc is struck between the carbon electrode and the metal to be cut. The metal melts instantly because of the high amperage you're using, and high velocity jets of air blast the molten metal away. The air blast is continuous and directed behind the point of arcing. The electrode, pardon me, the electrode is pushed forward at a rapid rate. The tra travel speed depends on the size of the electrode, the type of the material, the amperage, and air pressure. The depth and contour of the groove is controlled by the electrode angle, the travel speed, and the current. The width is determined by the size of the electrode. Um, the air carbon arc process is commonly used in steel foundries to remove defects from castings and so forth. It's used in uh, maintenance, in refineries, it's used to cut stainless steel pipe, uh, and they're, they're typically in stainless steel pipe and refiners, it's not really thick stuff. Um, the, the thing about stainless steel, cutting it with the air carbon arc process, yes, it will cut it, but it leaves icicles hanging down. So if it's something that you're going to have to clean up later on, you don't want to use carbon arc to cut stainless steel unless you have to. Um, go to Plasmark if you can. But if, if it's not available, then go ahead and use that. It's just get ready to use a grinder because it... Grinding stainless steel is tough, too. 
It takes a long time. It's, it's hard. It's difficult to grind. And using the, uh, the air arc process on it is going to leave you icicles. I've seen them four inches long that have to be removed. So it will cut it, but I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, air carbon arc cutting also prepares metal parts for hard facing and repair welding. Uh, the process can be used on all carbon, manganese, and stainless steel, copper, and nickel alloys, cast iron, and other hard to cut metals. Uh, the air carbon arc electrode is made of, of carbon and graphite, and it is coated with copper. Sizes range from 5 30 seconds to 1 inch thick. Now, I want you to pay attention to what it can cut and uh, about the, the graphite electrodes. I'm going to show you some now. I brought in an, a, a sampling of these electrodes. This is one eighth of an inch. It doesn't have any copper coating on it. It's too small for that copper coating. With this, you'd probably use 80 amps or so. Not a whole lot. Next, we're going to go to a 3 16 now, now you see the copper coating on there. And a good rule of thumb, if you're not sure if you're running the correct amperage, you see the, the tip here, this first part is graphite, and then the copper coating begins. If you want to know if you're running about the, amp, uh, the correct amperage, just watch as this burns away. And as this copper begins to burn away, uh, of course, this thing's going to be getting shorter, and you should always have about that much of the copper burnt away. If, if suddenly you've got this much graphite showing, you probably have too high an amperage for the size electrode that you're using. So let this be a guide to you to know whether or not you're using the correct amperage setting. Uh, then we have 5 16 and you can see we have the same graphite exposure here and then, the, and then the copper. And you can see we're getting a little thicker now. Here we go with 3 8 inch, thicker steel. And it depends on which one of these you're going to use. Depends on how thick you're going to cut, how accurate the cut needs to be, and how fast the job needs to get done. And then finally, this is the largest one that we have. This is one half inch. That's a half inch electrode. Um, we don't really have a welding power supply that would produce enough amperage to, to, to uh, successfully use this thing. Because you're going to probably have to run 500 amps, maybe, maybe 600 amps, to successfully use this one because it's so large. Okay? We, we do have a machine that'll do it, but I, I, I'd certainly try to stay away from this if you could. In the, in the work that you're going to be doing, we'll probably be using these two sizes. These are 3 16 and 5 16 electrodes. And this is, this is all you need for what we're going to be doing. And at the end of this chapter, I'll go over some tests that, that you have to do. I misspoke a little earlier um, out, of your, out of your course outline. There are some jobs from, from this chapter we want you to do, so we will look at those visually and check them off in the book saying that, yes, you did those, but you're not going to be given a grade like you will on the weldments. Okay. Let me show you the, the torch real quick before I get too far ahead of myself. This is the torch, and, and it's hard to see, but it says arc air right there. And in your book, you'll see some equipment that says the same thing, arc air. Of course, that's, a, that's a, the name of a manufacturer that produces these things. And if you can look in here real closely, uh, there's three little holes. That's where the compressed air comes out. And then the, you can see you have to pinch it like so and take your electrode and put it in this groove just like that. And if I were going to cut something, then I'd probably have a little bit of an angle like so, and you're always going to use a push. And those three little holes, you want those three little holes to always be between the electrode and whatever it is you're trying to cut. Don't ever put those holes on top because it won't work that way. So you always want them between the electrode, and I want you to remember that, keep them between the electrode and the work. This is also in your book. We'll talk about that in a second. Let me show you the other end of it. Now you notice that we've got this all taped up, and there's a glove over top of that. Well, that's because I can pull this thing out. That's because your welding machine is going to hook up here. It's the same as when, if you're running TIG. If you walk around to that one area where we do all the TIG welding, and you'll see some of the TIG rigs have this little thing here, where you would, you would take your clamp, your electrode holder clamp, and clamp it right on there. Now we're transferring power from the welding machine to this metal part. 
Well, there's metal parts in here too. That's why they're all taped up. If we didn't tape them up and they, and they touch the table, we're running 400 amps to air arc, we're going to have a problem. So we, we keep everything covered so that nothing uh, uh, will, will short out uh, when we don't want it to. And then your air, your air hose hooks up here. So you when you get ready to do this, and out in the field, you may have to check one of these out of the tool room. And then you're going to go to wherever you're working, you're going to set your amperage, you're going to hook it up here, you're going to hook your air up here, and then you're going to go ahead and load up a welding or, or an electrode gouging rod and, and cut stuff up. Okay, let's go back to your text. We're still on page 604 and I'm reading from the last paragraph in the first column. The compressed air passes through holes in the electrode holder which direct it parallel to the electrode. And that's what, just what I was talking about. The electrode holder contains an air control valve and a cable which carries both the current and the air. Uh, that control valve, I, didn't, I forgot to show you, it's got a little button on the handle there that you can push and that starts the airflow. The holder may be air or water cooled. The cable is connected to a welding machine and a source of compressed air. The regular constant current welding machine may be used. Direct current electrode positive polarity is used for most applications, but an electrode for alternating current is available. There is equipment for manual, manual machine and automatic uh, operations. And uh, that's about it. I do want to draw your attention to a picture over here on, on, on the next page. And this is a piece of equipment that, that shows an automatic system that's been set up. Uh, and you can see here's the name Arc Air on the side of that equipment. They put it on a carriage, a, me a mechanized carriage, so they can roll it along a piece of steel. And it's got a feeder there that will feed the, the uh, carbon arc rod through a tube, and they can mechanize this. <coughs> Same principle. OK. Also, back on page 604, if you look at the top there, you can actually go ahead and, and make a groove on plate for making partial penetration welds. And I, I, I'll get, say a little more on that here in a second. Let me talk about the, quickly about the gas metal arc cutting process. Gas metal arc cutting, we have gas metal arc welding, now we have gas metal arc cutting. Um, read a little bit about that. It says in the second paragraph, in bare metal arc cutting, the metal runs from the kerf as a result of the force produced by the pressure of the shielding gas and the jumping action of the arc, the metal vapor from the electrode, and the metal vapor from the electrode. Um, I've never used a metal carbon metal, a uh, gas metal arc cutting process, so I, I, I can't really give you any anecdotes about it because I haven't done it. Over on the next page, uh, it says you're going to use alternating current instead of direct current. Um, and then because of its lower cost, steel wire is usually used. Stainless steel wire and aluminum wire are also available. A variety of gases, including air, may be used for shielding the arc, but argon, an inert gas, is the most common. That may be a question. Oh, I may ask what is the most common, common gas, shielding gas, used in gas metal arc cutting and the process is not used extensively so that may be another question how common is that is it used more than this is it used more than that so pay attention to those gas tungsten arc cutting uh, I have used this um, let's flip the page uh, basically when you're using the gas tungsten arc cutting process I've used it on stainless steel and you might be welding along and on, on, on a piece of pipe and you've got to put a coupling in that piece of pipe. Well, you've got to cut a hole in that coupling. And Well, you don't want to use air arc because as I've explained, it'll leave icicles and it's pretty, pretty messy. A plasma arc may not be available. So you, but you've got a, 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 a TIG torch right there in your hand. So what you want to do is you've got to make a quick cut. So you'll run over you'll, or you'll send your helper over. He'll crank that machine up and you'll just sit there and you can work that torch in a little circle like this and it will actually melt that and blow it out for you. And crank it back down, clean it up, pull that scrap out of the pipe, and you're ready to put your plug in. That's how I've always used it in the past. So it, it works. It kind of leaves rounded edges, though, because it, it, the, the heat affected zone is a little wider. Uh, your book says the, the quality of the cut is good. Uh, metals that can be cut, and I want, want you to note this, are aluminum, magnesium, copper, silicone, bronze, nickel, copper, nickel, and stainless steels. 
The gas tungsten arc process can be used for manual or mechanized cutting. Uh, the same general equipment is used for both uh, TIG welding and cutting, a DC motor generator or transformer rectifier welding machine with straight polarity is recommended. Remember we talked about polarities earlier uh, and how two-thirds of the heat is, is generated on the reverse polarity and only one-third is on, on straight polarity. They're talking about you need to use straight polarity here, otherwise you're going to melt that tungsten electrode. So make sure you're on straight polarity whenever you're try, trying to do this. Alternating current causes the loss of tungsten from the electrode at the high currents required for cutting. If you're using AC, it's going to bounce between negative and positive. And every time it's on that positive side, it's going to be too hot for that tungsten to handle. And it's going to melt it. Okay. Uh, gas tungsten arc welding torches can be used for cutting. Although the current should be held within the current rating of the torch, currents in excess of the rating may be used for a short period. A cap or cup, I would call it a cup, size of one-eighth of an inch is recommended. Uh, caps that are too large produce, reduce the force of the gas flow. So they want you to use a, a smaller orifice so that you get more gas pressure coming out so that, that it's the force of that gas and gravity that, that's going to make your cut for you. Nitrogen can be used as the shielding gas. Cutting quality is increased by the use of an argon hydrogen gas mixture containing 65 to 80 percent uh, argon. So, there'll be a couple of questions coming out of that section. Carbon arc cutting. Remember we just talked about carbon arc cutting air. This is just straight carbon arc cutting. Um, carbon arc cutting, well, okay, let me just read here. It says metals that can be welded without post, post heat treatment may also be cut by the carbon arc process. Any alloy with high hardenability will be a non-machinable uh, condition after the cut, so you can't work it after the cut. It's going to harden it too much. Since the temperature of the arc is high, the method is used for cutting of cast iron, which has, by definition, cast iron has about 4% uh, carbon in it. It is also used in scrap yards and for the tearing down of steel structures. Uh, I underline this part. Carbon arc cutting is not used if a smooth and accurate cut is desirable. So what's that tell you? It's going to be pretty rough and pretty ragged, huh? So in carbon arc cutting, an electric arc is drawn between a carbon or graphite electrode and the material to be cut. The heat of the arc melts away the material. The material is removed from the cut by the force of gravity and the arc. So it's the same thing we're talking about with air, but you're not using air. You're simply letting it melt and cut through there and melt and fall down by the, by the force of gravity and by the force of the arc bouncing across here. So it's essentially the same thing. Uh, because of the heavy current values used in arc cutting, it is best to use graphite or hard carbon electrodes. Uh, if a great deal of cutting is to be done, a special electrode holder must be used. Uh, an ordinary electrode holder overheats because of the high currents. So you might have a question or two coming out of that, particularly that one that, that has to do with accurately, accurate, the accuracy of the cut and how is the metal removed by gravity and the force of the arc. Okay, shielded metal arc cutting. Again, I've, I've had some experience with this, um, and you can try it in your booth if you want to. You're just going to crank your machine up, so you've got to cut off an old chunk of metal that's on that somebody else tacked to your table, and uh, you don't have any, anything to do it with. So you you can reach down there and you can crank crank your welding machine up to say, oh, 250 amps, and use a small electrode like a piece of 6010, and you can actually just kind of pierce it and it'll, it'll burn it out of there. It's going to throw a lot of sparks, make a lot of smoke, and be noisy, uh, but you can do it that way. Let me read from your book. It says, the shielded metal arc process is used for cutting risers and non-ferrous gates in foundries and for non-ferrous materials in scrapyards. This process may also be used for underwater cutting. A specially constructed, fully insulated holder is necessary. The shielded metal arc process consists of drawing an arc between a covered electrode and the material being cut. Uh, covering forms a gaseous shield which protects the metal uh, being cut from the atmosphere. Material is removed from, from the cut by gravity and the force of the arc. <coughs> the electrode covering serves as an electrical insulation, permitting deep penetration of the electrode into the cut on heavy sections without shorting it out, shorting out the electrode. So if I, had to, if I had a really thick piece of steel and I had to reach down in there, I could really pierce it because the flux coating 
Let's take this one as an example. This is a, this is a piece of 7024, but you can see how thick that is. Well, that flux coating will keep it from arcing out against the side of the metal, so I can reach way down into a groove. I could go down into this hole here and really cut stuff out, and that's what they're talking about. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. On the next page, the last thing I want to say about this is that as with carbon electrode cutting, the speed of cut and width of cut depend upon the size of the electrode being used, the current values employed, the thickness of the material, the kind of material, and the skill of the cutter. Okay, we're almost done here. Oxygen arc cutting. Now, it's kind of funny. It's abbreviated AOC, AOC but it's pronounced oxygen arc cutting. So arc oxygen cutting would be the way you would read that, but it's oxygen arc cutting is a method of cutting, piercing, and gouging metals with an electric arc and a stream of oxygen. Bullet, question. You use a tubular coated electrode, and what they do is they put air down this thing, and once you start that arc, you know oxygen accelerates burning, and that's what it does. They feed oxygen to it, and the arc and that oxygen create a lot of heat and that's what they, they, they do for the cutting. Um, there's a picture of it on the next page and you can see a hollow tube and right, uh, this other picture is, is, is the special electrode holder that they would use to transfer electricity to the, to the electrode and also to pump the oxygen down the center of that hollow tube. Drop down a little bit, it says the oxygen and arc process can be used to cut those metals that have always been considered nearly impossible by standard methods. The electrodes were first developed primarily for use in underwater cutting. It is possible to cut ferrous and non-ferrous metals of any thickness and position. So pay attention to that, that may be a question. Such metals as stainless steels, nickel clad steels, bronze, copper, brass, aluminum, and cast iron are cut without any difficulty. Um, you may get a question as to the type of equipment. So the equipment includes an oxygen arc electric holder, oxygen arc coated tubular electrodes, an AC or DC welding machine, a tank of oxygen, and an oxygen regulating gauges. Over on the next page, bullet, the oxygen arc cutting electrode is a ferrous metal tube covered with a non-conductive coating. The function of the tube is to conduct current for, for the establishment and maintenance of the arc. The bore of the tube directs oxygen to the metal being cut. Drop down a little bit, it says bullet. Uh, the electrode is held by a special holder. This holder is similar in appearance to a welding electrode. When used for cutting underwater, a fully insulated holder equipped with a suitable flashback arrestor is required. Uh, let's see. Flip the page and, and look up in the left-hand corner, uh, figure 1724. This is a close-up schematic drawing of, of the process actually being used in, in, in cutting away metal. So I'm going to probably give you three or four questions on oxygen arc cutting there. Okay. Arc cutting machines. Uh, the only thing I want to say about that is <coughs> there's a variety of them. Some are computer controlled, some are optically controlled. Our shape cutter in the welding lab is one that is optically controlled. Read on that. Uh, stack cutter, read on that. Read on the beam cutter. And then let's get over here to where we're actually going to see uh, the practice jobs. And uh, figure 1731 is a typical plasma cutting system. That's the very, almost identical to the one that we have. And even the gun's very, very similar to that. Practice jobs. I want you to read through where it says uh, uh, plasma cutting, read how to do that, and then I want you to, to, to do these jobs. I want, I want you to cut a, uh, a square cutting with plasma arc cutting, so also refer to table 17.7. If you'll flip the page, 616, these are, this is a, another picture of a, of a pl handheld plasma arc torch as it's broken down. Look at that. The only one I want you to do is the square cut with the plasma arc. That's the only one you have to do. And you'll find that on your course outline. 
Then flip to page 619. And I want you to do job 17-J5. No, I'm sorry. That's 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 plasma arc. I, I, that's not the one. Read where it says air carbon arc cutting. It says the torch. It, it describes how it should be done. It, it continues on the next page. And then there's a, a schematic drawing of one on page 622, figure 1743. And now we're getting to where to the job I want you to do. It says uh, job 17-J6 gouging with carbon arc cutting air. So I want you to make a gouge and a butt joint to form a U-groove. And what I want you to do is, if you look in the, in the scrap bin there in the welding lab, you'll see a lot of joints in there where people ha are, that are in weld 1840 have welded two pieces of metal together using a V-groove. I want you to take that, flip it over, and as the schematic shows here on page 623, I want you to remove that weld down to clean steel. This would be a requirement for you if you ever had to, to do what's called a back weld. You have to take it down to clean steel. So I want you to practice that. And you don't have to practice it in all positions, but I want you to do it in, in, in the flat and horizontal positions. If you want to try overhead, that's fine. Make sure you're wearing proper protective clothing to do that. If you want to do it vertical down, that's fine too. But I want you to practice removing a weld down to clean steel. Uh, and then the next one, job 17-J7. Removal of a weld with, with uh, carbon arc cutting air. And here I want you to do the same thing on a T-joint. And when you're doing it on a T-joint, you want to try to not get into the base metal any more than you have to. You're simply going to dig down and dig that metal out of there until you see a crack appear where the two pieces of steel came together. That's the root. And then you're going to follow that until you can take it apart and have two pieces of steel in your hand. So those are the jobs that I want you to do with that. Um, for more information, look it up, look it up on your, in your course outline or get with Jeff and I and, and we'll explain it to you a little more thoroughly.